what to expect postpartum, what to expect physically, what the timeline is other than like that six week checkup and then you're good to go, which is not true by any means for the majority of people. Uh, and we're neglecting things like our postpartum nutrition, which has a huge impact again on, on our physical healing, the tissue healing, as well as on our mood and, um, you know, whether or not we're experiencing symptoms of postpartum depression or anxiety. Welcome to the Radical Health Rebel podcast. I'm your host, Lee Brandon. This work started for me several decades ago when I started to see the impact I could make on people, helping them to identify the root cause of their health problems that no doctor could figure out, including serious back, knee, shoulder and neck injuries, acne and eczema issues, severe gut health problems, even helping couples get pregnant after several IVF treatments had failed. And it really moves me to be able to help people in this way. And that is why I do what I do and why we have this show. In this episode, I had the pleasure of speaking with Ariel Martone, a doctor of physical therapy, neuroclinical specialist, certified yoga instructor, and certified pre- and postnatal coach turned postpartum wellness coach. Ariel has a wealth of knowledge and experience working with postpartum women, and she shared some valuable insights with us on how women can best avoid chronic pain postpartum. We also had the pleasure of Ariel's young children joining us briefly during the interview in the background. Stay tuned for this informative and inspiring conversation with Dr. Ariel Martone on preventing postpartum pain. Ariel Martone, welcome to the Radical Health Rebel podcast. Thanks for coming on the show. Yeah, thank you for having me. Yeah, it's great to have you on. So, Ariel, to kick things off, could you share with the audience your professional education, your own past potum experience, and why you decided to focus on postpartum women in your practice? Sure, absolutely. So I am I'm a doctor of physical therapy by training. I graduated Columbia in 2009, so I've been practicing for quite some time. My initial focus was more neuro-based, and I became a neuroclinical specialist. Um, but as I was kind of transitioning through my career and life and knew that I also wanted to start a family. I was starting to look at my different options because one, that's the beauty of physical therapy is that there's so much that you can really do with it and it can always kind of shift and change, uh, which is one of the draws that brought me to it in the first place. Um, But rehab is really intensive in the amount of hours that I was working and it just wasn't conducive for (laughs) where I needed to be. Um, So I kind of shifted out of that. And I knew I always also had an interest in women's health from back in my um, PT school days. That was actually my, um, my like capstone project at the end of the year was a a group project with a few other therapists, um, which was on safe exercise in pregnancy. So there was always that kind of underlying background and interest in women's health. Uh, as I was transitioning to motherhood, I had to go through an IVF journey. And that was kind of one of the things that brought me out of rehab was I needed flexibility to make it to my appointments, do all the blood work, all of that. So very long story short, after about four and a half years of trying, I had my son. And then two years later, had my daughter. And with my daughter, I had a really challenging postpartum experience. I had postpartum depression and I had some pelvic floor issues that I was dealing with as well. Because of my profession and the fact that I was already kind of starting to transition out of the rehab world, the neuro rehab world, and into more of the women's health, pelvic health space, I had a sense of what I needed to do. I knew what was available to me that, for one, that healing was needed postpartum, um, which to me seems like very basic information that unfortunately is really, it's not, it's not, um, it's not the common thought (laughs) that rehab, uh, or rehabilitation is needed after you give birth, whether it be vaginally or cesarean birth. Um, so I knew what was available to me. I had a sense of what I needed to do. I did make an appointment with the pelvic, um, floor specialist who was amazing, kind of confirmed what I was kind of finding in myself. Um, And because of that process, 
it really kind of pushed me into shifting into not only the women's health, public health space, but really postpartum wellness, because I was dealing with the emotional recovery, postpartum and postpartum depression, as well as the physical symptoms. And it wasn't until I really started to merge the two together, really kind of connect my healing on the physical level and the emotional level that I really started to make true progress uh, in my postpartum recovery. Um, And I wanted to just make it more accessible to new moms because it was, like I said, it was a challenge for me. And I have the, the health background, have the physical therapy background, but it wasn't easy to find. It wasn't easy to necessarily make it to all of my appointments. Uh, and that's why, again, I really kind of shifted my focus into uh, pelvic health and postpartum wellness and really bringing it to moms where they're at at home. So I do work, um, you know, I'm, I'm in the Boston area, so I, I do see patients and women at home north of Boston. And I also um, am really shifting to an online virtual platform because it's just, honestly, it's just easier for moms when they mm. are new early on. Mm. Yeah, we can we can just hear your kids playing in the background, <laughs> which, <laughs> which is which is proof, which is proof that you're definitely a postpartum uh, person. Yeah, I'm, I'm still in it. They are five and two and a half. Okay. Yeah. Imagine. So the the audience can uh, enjoy enjoy the background noise. <laughs> no, that's absolutely fine. So let's 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 look at this scenario. So a woman has just given birth, you know, like women have been doing for millions of years. Does she really need to rehabilitate her body after delivery? And if so, what does that look like? Yes. Yeah. So yes, she does need to rehabilitate her body afterwards, just like we need to rehabilitate our body after um, a joint replacement surgery, after a stroke, after an ankle sprain. And I like to use the ankle sprain example because sure, you can not do anything, right? You can just have your ankle sprain. You can kind of limp about. Will it heal? Yes, our body is going to heal. Will it heal appropriately? No. Are you going to be able to do all of the same things that you did previously? No, and not without pain um, or some type of limitation. But if we rehab that ankle sprain, we are able to get back to the activities that we were doing beforehand and enjoy them and sometimes do them even better than before when we kind of tweak uh, tweak our movement patterns and do what works best for our body. So when we look at that example, I feel like it translates really well to the birth situation. Um, and we'll, you know, vaginal birth or cesarean birth. Um, but with a cesarean birth, it is a major abdominal surgery. Uh And with any major surgery, there should, and I'm going to say should here, be a rehabilitation process in, in the States. That's very much lacking. Again, another reason why I kind of shifted into this field. Um, but even with the vaginal birth, which we, you know, think of as a natural process, it's been occurring for, you know, all time. Um, but if we want to, if we want to get back to, optimal health, then we absolutely need to recover. When when we don't, we are left often with a lot of pelvic floor dysfunction. Um, but yes, so yes, you absolutely do need to uh, to recover from birth, whether it's vaginal or cesarean. Mm. Yeah, I mean if you look at if you look at either either delivery, you know, you know you've got the natural birth and you've got the cesarean section. Obviously, a natural birth, there's a, a huge amount of stretching of the pelvic floor muscles. With the cesarean section, obviously, you're, you're cutting through four layers of the abdominal wall, which, which is pretty important, right? But then the other thing that, that happens through pregnancy is huge changes in the, in the spinal curvatures. Now, Okay, so only a nine month period, and generally, generally they, they they'll go back to some degree, but all those things are putting quite a quite a load through the body, and that's even without considering the weight of the baby and the extra fluid that's being carried in the abdominal yeah. cavity as well. So, you know, if you were training for 
I don't know, let's say a marathon, you know, you're putting a lot of stress through the body and it would probably take about nine months for most people to train f- to run a marathon. And, you know, going through nine months of pregnancy where you've got this human being growing bigger every day inside of you and the, and the load on your f- body physically is getting heavier and heavier every day. You know, that's, that's quite a physical, I, I, I wouldn't use the word trauma, but it's quite a physical stress that the body's No, it ab- absolutely can be a trauma, especially the birth process itself. Mm. Um, so, you know, with everything that you were saying, yeah, our, our pelvis shifts during pregnancy. So whether it's a vaginal birth or a cesarean birth, the pregnancy process is the same. And that mm. process in and of itself as you were saying, changes our body very dramatically. Um, And some of the changes that happen are our pelvis widens to make space for the baby. That doesn't necessarily go back right away. Uh, It usually takes about 12 weeks postpartum for our pelvic bones to kind of shift back to where they were. And sometimes they don't always go back, depending on different um, situations. Uh, The abdominal wall stretches will have a separation in the majority of pregnant women will have a separation or a diastasis recti. You you may have, you know, if you're postpartum, you may have heard of that word and it sometimes Uh sounds really scary. It's not, it's a very normal adaptation because our abdominal wall, our abdominal muscles are stretched and they have to make room. So there's going to be some separation. And for some women that returns on its own within, you know, a few month period of time. And for some women, it doesn't. And again, that kind of severity of it definitely depends. Um, But because of the stretching that occurs, the muscles are weaker. You mentioned the curves of the spine changing, Mm -hmm. and that can have a huge impact on how we function during, you know, during our day-to-day activities. It can have a huge impact on if we are having any pain. Uh, our breathing is changed, and that doesn't always go back to the way it was. In fact, it more likely than not does not return back to that pre-pregnancy state unless we are mindfully rehabilitating our body to work on bringing the ribs closer back together, on kind of normalizing um, normalizing the muscle balances in our body to kind of reestablish our pre-pregnancy posture and curves. Um, and then like you were saying for the cesarean birth, yeah, it's, you know, the four layers of the muscle, but then there's also, you know, the connective tissue, Mm. the, the organ, the, um, uterus itself. So all of those multiple, multiple layers that are cut open to have the surgery on top of all of the pregnancy changes that were occurring, um, you know, throughout the nine months of pregnancy. Yeah. I mean, you know, my experience is that most most women postpartum, if they're coming to me, it's back pain. That's that's the most yeah. common thing that, that I see. Now, of course, in in the lumbar spine, when you're pregnant, it generally goes into an excessive lordosis. Mm-hmm. You've also got the loosening of the connective tissues, which which you mentioned. But also, the the pelvis is uh, anteriorly rotated, which then unlocks the sacroiliac joints, which now become more unstable under all this load of the baby in the abdominal cavity as well. And it's it's almost like it's amazing that some women can actually go through pregnancy and not have these issues, right? <laughs> yeah. Yes. It, it, it can be shocking. And, um, you know, I was lucky enough that I actually felt really good in pregnancy. And I know that it is lucky. That's not everybody's <laughs> experience. You know, I enjoyed being pregnant, but it was the postpartum that was more of a struggle for me. And so I think that you're going to feel it at one point or another, kind of depending on what's going on. Um, but, you know, I, the volumes of women experiencing dysfunction postpartum that are so normalized um, as just either a part of life or a part of mom life are, you know, really staggering, you know, the amount of women, like you said, who have back pain, who that don't always initially realize that it's because of the postpartum um, changes that had occurred, the pregnancy mm. and postpartum changes, uh, or pelvic pain, things like urinary incontinence or leaking. And again, to the point of it, not just going away, 
you know, there are studies that show if you're having leaking, if you're having urinary incontinence at three months postpartum, you are at a 92% chance or risk of having it at five years postpartum. So these things don't just happen to go away on their own if they're not addressed. The back pain most often won't get better on its own if it's not addressed. Yeah, what I find quite fascinating, you know, if you look look back at our evolution, you know, mammals started off as four-legged animals and you know that the female would be pregnant but the spine would be horizontal because obviously you're on all fours and probably apes do it to us to some degree you know in terms of being upright but you know we're probably the first mammal that i can think of or well, maybe kangaroos to a degree whereby well they, well they're i mean they're different aren't they they're their pregnancy is completely different to other yeah, mammals. Yeah. <laughs> um, but I guess it's still kind of in the front of the body, in the ab- abdomen to a degree. Um, but I guess my point is, if you think, you know, the way that mammals originally evolved was to be pregnant whilst our spine was horizontal. Now, obviously, our spines are, are vertical, and that puts a completely different physical load through the body um, I mean, in one way, it's amazing, but in the second way, you kind of think there's there's possibly more challenges to pregnancy f- for a human than it is for other mammals. Yeah, but it very well could be. Um, I think just, you know, the changes that our bodies go through in general um, are just kind of amazing. But yeah, as far as, you know, having, being on all fours, but then it, it it poses different risks, right? Because if we're in that more quadruped position, we are putting more load and more stress on our abdominals. So it might be protective mm. perhaps to our spine, but then our yeah. abdominal wall might be feeling more stretched out. So it's, you know, that's hard to say. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. It kind of, kind of swings and roundabouts to some degree. Yeah. In your, obviously you've got your own personal experience, but also your professional experience. I think you've kind of already answered this, but maybe if you could just go a bit further on it. Would you say it's normal to have pain postpartum? Catherine had always been fit and active when she suffered a debilitating back injury. She was barely able to get out of bed or walk without being in excruciating pain. She visited her GP, who prescribed anti-inflammatories, painkillers and muscle relaxants, and also referred her to an orthopaedic consultant. Catherine was bedridden for 10 days and subsequently could only get through the day with large doses of the prescribed pills. Catherine was diagnosed with a prolapsed disc at L3-4 and she was offered anaesthetic injections or spinal surgery. She was horrified and concerned that she would have constant back problems for the rest of her life. Catherine was miserable, could hardly drive, a day at work was agony and any movements in bed were very painful. I carried out detailed postural assessments, muscle strength tests and analysis of her movement patterns. I identified the biomechanical problems and prescribed a very specific exercise program to correct her posture, reduce her level of pain, and to prevent the injury reoccurring. After five weeks on the program, the pain had reduced hugely in her back and Catherine stopped taking painkillers. After 10 weeks, Catherine was back jogging and doing more intensive exercise with absolutely no back pain, and she was so pleased that she was able to pick up her young son again. If you're suffering like Catherine was and you'd like to find out more about getting to the root cause of your back pain, go to www.bodycheck.co.uk and request a consultation. Now, back to the podcast. Now, now, caveat, are you going to have soreness postpartum? Yes. It's like you ran a marathon, whether it was a vaginal birth or a cesarean birth, the process is intense. I've, I've done both. I had an emergency C-section with my son. So I, I was induced and labored and pushed for almost like three hours of pushing labor was days. Um, and then with my daughter, I was able to have a a VBAC, a vaginal birth after C-section, um, and your body is just sore. Your arms are sore. Everything gets involved. You know, I was I was surprised at how mm-hmm. sore my arms actually were after the birth. Um, but um, so ha- having some post post uh, event soreness, as if it was any type of 
big physical event, yes, that is normal. Having, you know, two to three, maybe upwards of like four or five days of soreness, sure. Everything's going to feel a little bit achy. Uh, if you had a vaginal birth, of course, you're going to have some vaginal soreness. Uh, it's the area is swollen. Um, but pain afterwards, no, it's not normal. It's not normal to have pelvic pain. It's not normal to have back pain, hip pain. Those are all signs that you need to address your recovery. Uh, yes. So yeah. So pain, you know, soreness right afterwards, normal upwards of like, you know, definitely two, two days afterwards, still very normal. And I could say like, even up to the first, like five, five to seven days, that first week, if you're still feeling some muscle soreness, normal. If you're feeling pain, it's not normal. So whether it's SI pain, you know, sacroiliac pain, whether it's low back pain, upper mid back pain, um, is definitely not normal. Other pain that uh, a lot of women experience are hip pain uh, or pelvic pain. And that could really be anywhere in mm. the pelvic area. Um, but, you know, pain with intercourse when women are given the the green light and the go ahead, uh, that's something that I feel like is really normalized. It's very common and it's not normal. Mm. Yeah, it's interesting, you know, if you watch wildlife programs and you'll see, I don't know, wildebeest and, you know, the wildebeest drops a calf on, on the ground and the calf kind of shakes itself and then they just go run, <laughs> they just run off, um, which I think to some degree, obviously it's a different, it's a different animal. I'm not, I'm not, we're not, I'm not comparing apples with apples here, but I think the point I'm trying to make is when you, when you live in a natural environment, then things like, you know, eating eating and eating a natural diet, not being mm -hmm. too stressed, you know, your pregnancy and your labor should really be like that. Would you Would you agree? Oh, uh, yes, absolutely. And I, you know, I say this as someone who I I gave birth in a hospital. Um, I, you know, I know a lot of women who are giving birth at home. I think that's amazing. Uh, but I think ultimately you have to choose what you're most comfortable with. Uh, for me, you know, being a healthcare provider, I'm comfortable in hospitals. I was very comfortable with my provider. I was very comfortable requesting for what I wanted and speaking up and asking questions. Mm. Uh, and so all of those things led to a better, or at least a good experience, despite again with my son, it having to be an emergency C section was obviously less than ideal, but I, very much trusted my provider. Uh, she was also a friend of mine. So I, I trusted she had my best interest. I was able to ask the questions. We were able to push it off for as long as possible. All of those things matter. Um, but yes, very much to your point, birth is very medicalized in general. And postpartum, I would say, is forgotten about. Mm. And I'm glad that you brought up the nutrition piece because it's really important. And our you know, if you look at a lot of postpartum traditions, um, they do revolve around food and nourishing the body and eating a lot of warm foods, a lot of cooked foods, broths, things that are really nourishing to the body. And in our Western society, that's not so much the case. You have the baby and it's very much bounce back culture where we're kind of like, okay, well, you're not eating for two anymore, in quotes, because that's never really the case either. Mm. But we're not eating for two anymore. So it's time to drop the calories down or have some more salads and smoothies. Or we just get so overwhelmed and busy because again, we're, we're not prioritizing postpartum in our Western society, especially in the States where we have almost no you know, maternity leave. Um, we're lucky if you are in a full-time job that you can qualify for the, you know, the 12 weeks of FMLA coverage. A lot of times that's not even, you know, fully paid for. So there's a, so many social factors that I think contribute to the postpartum that we're seeing today of, you know, new moms having a lot of pain, not being able to prioritize their healing, uh, not knowing that they need to heal because we are such a like quick 
pace, get back to, you know, back to work as soon as possible, back to your body as soon as possible, but that we really don't honor the postpartum period for what it is. And we don't prioritize, you know, and for, you know, for no fault of our, of our own, because we are, you know, that's kind of the society that we're in. And those are the messages that we were told. We're not told any information on what to expect postpartum, what to expect physically, what the timeline is, other than like that six week checkup, and then you're good to go, which is not true by any means oh. for the majority of people. Uh, and we're neglecting things like our postpartum nutrition, which has a huge impact, again, on on our physical healing, the tissue healing, as well as on our mood and, um, you know, whether or not we're experiencing symptoms of postpartum depression or anxiety. I think, you know, I think it's a huge piece of the equation that's often... I don't even want to say neglected, but we're just very much told the wrong things because it, we are so kind of engrossed in a diet culture, a diet society that a proper nutrition postpartum is, we're just given the wrong information. I don't want to say we're giving no information, but we're yeah. told basically like start dieting, start doing these things, start dropping the baby weight. Um but yeah, it's it's so important that I'm actually in the middle of taking a postpartum nutrition certification because I feel like it goes so hand in hand with mm. the physical recovery that we we can't leave it out. So I, I don't want to leave it out for the women that I'm working with. Yeah, I mean, it, it sounds quite strange that when you're in a position where you need all the nutrients you can possibly get your hands on, that someone's being advised to cut calories right? Because yeah. you need calories, but you need good quality calories because your body needs to heal. And now if you're going to start to restrict yourself, not only are you restricting yourself from calories, but you're restricting yourself from nutrients at the same time. Yeah. And we, you know, we, we come out of the birthing experience generally being pretty depleted. Um, you know, one of the reasons why taking a prenatal vitamin is so important and also making sure that you're eating, you know, good quality food, throughout your pregnancy is mm. that the baby takes so, so much from the mom throughout the whole growing gestational process that we enter postpartum in a depleted state. Um, I don't have the the numbers on me right now or the statistics on me right now. Um, but the, the percentage of women who are depleted in, um, either like B12, vitamin D, um, iodine, those are really big, um, depletions in the mm. postpartum period. And then yes, to your point, then we're told to, to, you know, drop calories or focus on getting our body back when we actually need more calories when we are postpartum than we did in pregnancy, uh, especially if you're breastfeeding, but really in that those first, you know, four to six weeks postpartum when our tissue is healing. And again, with a C-section, more so being the case because our body is really healing from all of the um, incisional, mm. you know, incisional wounds that were created. So we have to lay down new tissue. We have to kind of, you know, build that back up. And that takes a lot of protein. It takes a lot of nutrients to do that um, in a supportive way to, to make the recovery as optimal as possible and just speed it up to some extent. Um, but yeah, if you're breastfeeding on top of that, that's, you know, about 500 additional calories each day in order to sustain that. Uh, yeah. When you mentioned about nutrition during pregnancy, I would take it a step further and say it's, it's actually important to really get your nutrition on point, probably two years before conception. And then you've got the nine months or so of pregnancy, and then you've got your postpartum nutrition, which, you know, you really need to to nail that the thing the thing that i would add to that as well is you know the thing that is really important as well is exercise and and trying to get your body in as good a uh, posture as possible and try and make sure that you've got as much stability in your joints as possible again yeah. if, if even before conception right because you know i know from experience of working with women through their pregnancy both you know with nutrition and exercise i'm well 100 percent of the women that i've worked with you you can't tell they're pregnant even at nine months looking from behind 
right? They don't mm-hmm. look like someone who's, you know, carrying too much weight. And then what I tend to what I tend to get in terms of feedback from a lot of women, they say, they say, you know, postpartum, they say, oh, they've never seen anyone heal as quickly as me before. And it's like, well, that's because you were doing a lot of the, the right things before you even got pregnant. You did it throughout your pregnancy and, and you're carrying on that postpartum as well. So, you know, it's no wonder when you put that kind of preparation in that, you know, people are, are able to recover so much quicker. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, and there's there's so many benefits to exercising during pregnancy. And yeah, to your point, like, you know, as a physical therapist and, you know, a, a former athlete, um, it it should be a way of life. And mm. for some people it is. Um, and it doesn't have to be, it doesn't have to be complicated or to that like athlete level. I'm not, we can't rib it in here. Um, but, but, you know, you, you mentioned, um, you know, it being like a marathon earlier and yes, Mm. exactly. So like you need to prepare your body throughout the whole pregnancy as if you're preparing for a marathon, Mm. uh, maybe not necessarily running. Although, you know, if that was something you did beforehand, absolutely. You can do that through pregnancy. Um, you know, from my own personal experience, I was able to work out throughout the entire pregnancy with my son. I ran up until 39 weeks and I did, you know, it was a C-section, but I did have a really good physical recovery with him. Uh, you know, and also, you know, to that point, I, I knew how to get myself out of bed after having a C-section. I knew that I needed to walk every day after having the C-section. I knew what activities I needed to kind of push off for even longer than the six week mark and made sure that I really kind of staged my recovery. But it was, it was generally really good. Um, with my daughter, I unfortunately wasn't able to exercise during pregnancy. I had, um, placenta previa. So where the placenta is lower than it's supposed to be and kind of, um, you know, covering the cervix. Uh, So I wasn't able to work out until really closer towards the end of my pregnancy with her where it lifted and I was cleared. And that's why I was able to attempt to be back. Um, But I noticed a lot, you know, my pregnancy was different. While while it was still generally pain-free and I still felt really good, I was out of breath more easily Um, with her when I was working and when I was going up and down stairs, I like noticed it more than with my son and the physical recovery was definitely different. Um, and again, there was more, you know, the emotional stuff as well. Um, and, you know, again, to the benefits of working out throughout pregnancy, there are, you know, some studies that show that it can be, um, kind of protective against postpartum mood disorders, such as depression um, and anxiety. If you're working out throughout the pregnancy, there's also a lot of um, really positive effects on the baby and self. So there's so many reasons to kind of continue. Uh, And to your point, focusing on stability, I think is kind of key. So, you know, your workouts are going to change during pregnancy. You're going to have to modify certain things, um, but focusing on that stability piece um, is going to be really beneficial. Uh, And then again, even in the postpartum phase, once you are able to start getting back to working out again and and towards recovering is really kind of focusing on some stability rather than, you know, the flexibility piece. Now, you know, with that said, we do need to also let our pelvic floor relax. I think a lot of times people, you know, after childbirth, we think that we need to kind of tighten up and, um, you know, again, that's that get that body back and tighten everything back up. And it's really, honestly, I think detrimental to women's recovery, because even though our muscles stretch out on the pelvic floor, it's, you know, around 300% that the muscles have to lengthen um, during the the delivery process. Um, Even though they're so stretched, they're um, there also is a lot of tension that's held mm. in those muscles. And as they're trying to get back to their original length, because they will get back to their original length, um, a lot of tension occurs. And if we're just trying to tighten up right away and not addressing the tension piece, then that can cause some issues as well. 
Yeah, I mean, generally, you get more tension in a muscle by stretching it than you do from shortening it, right? And that's, mm-hmm. that's often, you know, why you get trigger points in a muscle is often when it's lengthening and it's, you know, so for instance, a lot of people have forward head posture and that and that's and that's the case during pregnancy as well. Yeah. And wh- where do most people get trigger points? When they're in their elevator scapula and their upper trapezius, yeah. right? Around that you upper, can feel them already. <laughs> yeah, right? So, you know, and those muscles are basically holding on to the, the head that's moving forwards. Right, so you put tension through a muscle for a long period of time, it's going to start to to get sore. So yeah, that's a good, that's a really good point that you make about about the pelvic floor muscles. Now, you've kind of you've kind of led on to the next question, and I, you've kind of answered it, but maybe you could go into a bit more detail. But I'll ask the question in full, and then you can elaborate. So, you know, exercise professionals talk a lot about Kegel exercises postpartum, which I think is what you were referring to there. For the audience, can you explain what Kegel exercises are and, in your opinion, how effective are they? Sure. So so a Kegel is, simply put, just a pelvic floor contraction. So if you want to think about a bicep curl, you know, that's the bicep muscle contraction contracting as you bring your hand towards your shoulder. A pelvic floor muscle contraction is the pelvic floor lifting up. So it's kind of squeezing in and lifting up. And that's a Kegel. And you may have heard it, um, you know, try to stop the the flow of urine. Don't do, don't do that one. <laughs> um, but that's that kind of sensation of kind of pulling in or, or if you feel like you need to pass gas, trying to not pass the gas, so that pulling in. Um, do I think they're effective for some people? Yes, they can be effective. Should they be the go-to cue and thing to do for everyone um, after having birth? No, I don't think so. And I think they can cause... So a few thoughts on it. I think they can cause more problems early on when we get back to that tension piece. So, you know, again, as you very nicely explained, like how the muscles, even though they're lengthened, can have a lot of tension in them because I feel like that's something that people, it's hard to kind of picture initially. Mm. Um, so even though the muscles are stretched out and lengthened, they're kind of working harder to do their job um, and they're getting more muscle tension. So if we are just constantly contracting the muscle that's already overworking and already really tense, we're going to cause more issues. We're going to make it more tense. That's going to lead to... Um, you know, increased pelvic pain. It can also contribute to urinary leakage, and it can really even contribute to um, some symptoms of prolapse that that people might be experiencing. Mm. Um, also, you know, when we're when we're told about doing a Kegel, we're kind of told that quick contraction. You know, do a couple of squeezes, those lifts when you're at a traffic light, or you know, whatever external cue you want to do, brushing your teeth. Um, or, you know, often it's something that you're encountering a lot during the day. So that's why I feel like the the stoplight is kind of a, a really common time where people are told to do them, that way they're getting a ton in each day. Um, but when we look at the pelvic floor muscles, they're majority postural muscles. So they're majority slow twitch fibers. And they do we do have some quick twitch, you know, fast twitch fibers in there, but it, it's closer to 30% fast mm. twitch, 70 percent slow twitch. So when we're doing those fast contractions, we're not even really targeting the majority of the pelvic floor muscle fibers because we're doing the slow, quick, quick contraction um, activity instead. So we're not, you know, we're not getting the full muscle or the majority of the muscle, which is that slower since sustained. Mm. Um, and we're doing it on top of muscles that are already really tense and holding a lot of tension. And then on top of that, a lot of women don't know how to do a Kegel correctly. So if they're just told kind of what to do, um, you know, they might not be contracting the entire pelvic floor. They may only be contracting a portion. You might be contracting more just the front portion of the pelvic floor and not targeting the posterior portion of the pelvic floor. So we really want to make sure that if we're giving an exercise or we're giving a cue that that the person that we're giving them to knows how to do it correctly. Otherwise, you know, we we can cause a whole host of problems. If if someone thinks they're contracting their pelvic floor, but really they're bearing down and kind of pushing out and straining, 
that's going to lead to a whole host of other problems, including prolapse and other pelvic floor dysfunction. So we want to make sure that they're doing it correctly if we're giving them the cue. And that first we're tackling things like pelvic floor tension, muscle tightness first uh, before we go into that cue. Yeah, so I've got a couple of questions on that. So, because I'm just getting curious now. So, so from your view, so someone's given birth, they've got tension, you know, probably probably got trigger points in their pelvic floor mm-hmm. muscles. Would you suggest that potentially having the trigger points worked on would be a good place to start for a lot of women? Yes. Yeah. And, um, you know, which is one of the reasons why pelvic floor physical therapy I think is so important and can be really helpful early on. Do I think everyone needs to have hands-on, you know, manual trigger point release? No, definitely not. I think there's a lot that can be done, um, you know, hands-off altogether with um, positioning, stretching, you know, things like happy baby pose, um, child's pose, where, and, and while doing that, also focusing on the breath and releasing tension through the breath, as well as working on kind of lengthening and relaxing the pelvic floor, you know, with the inhale. So as our diaphragm descends, thinking that the pelvic floor also descends and then kind of getting rid of releasing the tension on the exhale. Um, so I think there's a lot of work that can be done that way. But for some people, they absolutely are going to need trigger point release and know whether that's, um, you know, going to a physical therapist and getting trigger point release done that way. Um, great. Some people might have success being able to do it on their own. You can do mm-hmm. some external trigger point releases with, you know, use of like a lacrosse ball or tennis ball, um, you know, the small yoga balls, um, you know, even really sitting on a big physio ball and again, breathing into that might mm-hmm. help release some of those trigger points um also yeah yeah that makes that makes complete sense and i mean you know i I mean i don't i don't do trigger point work on pelvic floor muscles i'm not trained in that and Mm -hmm. i don't particularly want to be either um but one of the things i do with people i do you know i do trigger point work inside their mouth right so maybe on the on the pterygoid muscles or masters etc but what i do is i teach the client to do it themselves so they can do it in between treatment. It's quite, you know, it's easy to do, um, particularly the lateral pterygoid, which is a, a nasty one for most people in the mouth. So I imagine there is a degree of being able to to teach women to be able to do that themselves to a degree. Ab- absolutely. And I'm so, I'm so glad that you mentioned it. Yeah, there's so much work that we can do for our pelvic floor um, through our jaw and our neck. Um, it's amazing how connected they are through fascial lines. Uh, as well as postural changes and shifts. And, you know, when our pelvic floor is affected and when we're, you know, we're tilted more anteriorly in our pelvis, it, you know, we're all connected and it stacks up and it's going to completely change your head posture. And then from there, get trigger points in certain areas. So yeah, there's a lot of work that you can do for your pelvic floor that is not intravaginal at all. Mm. And that is really, you know, jaw, throat, neck area related. Yeah. Yeah, so I'm, I guess leading on from that, because I would imagine the first place you'd want to start is to is to relax the tension in those muscles. Mm-hmm. But then, but then the next point is okay, but we do need to strengthen them. You know, we do need they do need they do need to shorten again. Mm-hmm. And what you've said is, you know, you obviously need to focus on um, the the slow twitch fibers, as you said, seventy percent of the muscles are slow twitch. So you need to do low intensity, long duration um, sets, let's call them. That's what I call a, a set of exercises. When you get to that point, what would be what would be your approach in terms of teaching people to, to um, condition their pelvic floor muscles, in particular their, their slow twitch fibers? Yeah. So, so yes. So first we're working on kind of releasing the tension and then kind of building from there. And a lot of times I won't necessarily start with cueing the Kegel. Sometimes I will just to kind of figure out when can they do it? Do they know what we're talking about? And to just bring awareness to that area, but rather than thinking about just doing, um, you know, quick contractions, you can think about doing, you know, 
two to three and just see if you can get the contraction. So get a lift. Can you hold for about two seconds? And then can you relax? But with that, you need to make sure that they're fully relaxing and lengthening and not just, um, you know, lifting the pelvic floor and then relaxing only about halfway and not getting the full length because, you know, getting that proper length tension relationship is so important, especially with the pelvic floor, because it's an area that we hold a lot of tension in, in general. And then after, after birth, we hold even more tension there. Um, but I like to do a lot of work with, um, kind of the accessory muscles. So like doing a lot of squats, a lot of squat work, lunges, getting the hamstrings and adductors to fire and seeing if we can connect that to the pelvic floor um, with a lot of intention, um, as well as, um, you know, working the the deeper core muscles, working the transversus abdominis, because as the pelvic floor contracts, it kind of automatically brings on some of the transversus anyway. So saying if we can kind of cue it from there initially so that we're not just, and again, it depends, you know, this is really, if I'm talking about someone who is more tight than weak, they probably still have a lot of weakness though, because often they go hand in hand. Mm. Um, But someone who has a lot of tension still, someone who really doesn't have much tension and is really just weak, it will be slightly, you know, a slightly different approach uh, where I might be cueing um, that pelvic floor contraction a little bit more. Uh, do Do you find people that have had cesareans, do they have a more challenging time being able to connect to and contract the pelvic floor muscles? Not necessarily. Um, sometimes it'll be a harder connection with the inner core work again, just because of um, the incision. So getting mm. the transversus to fire. Uh, also, it can be really uncomfortable if they haven't done any scar work. So I will mm. do a lot of scar work and you know uh, desensitization techniques to that area because if we're feeling discomfort, you know, the last thing that we want to do is create more discomfort in an area that's already uncomfortable. And then we're now associating, you know, the activity or the exercise with the pain and they kind of, you know, feedback loop onto each other. Um, So kind of working that scar area first and then connecting there. Um, So I don't really notice that they have a harder time connecting to their pelvic floor and they are still at risk for pelvic floor dysfunction you are at a higher risk of pelvic floor dysfunction if you had a vaginal birth, especially if you had a vaginal birth with any type of tearing or episiotomy. Your risk is then even greater because the muscle itself was then, you know, torn or or um, cut through. Um, so it's I wouldn't say it's a harder time, but they can still have difficulty with it and they can still have pelvic mm. floor dysfunction. Yeah, no, I just asked that question. I know it might sound like a strange question, but you know, obviously, as you mentioned, you know, the transversus and the pelvic floor are on the same neurological reflexive loop. And I was just wondering if, mm-hmm. because you've cut through that muscle, whether that, that has a direct effect on the on the pelvic floor, but that's that's not your experience, which, yeah. is, which is good it, to hear. It doesn't, yeah, it doesn't seem to be. And I don't yeah. have any, you know, research one way or the other for it. Yeah. So with the conditioning of the pelvic floor. So I've got a few, I've got a couple of questions here. So there's mm-hmm. some techniques that I learned 20 odd years ago, and I'd just like to get your views on them. So when, when cueing women to contract the pelvic floor, so these are a couple of cues that I've heard. So one is imagine that there's an elevator. I don't know if you've heard this one. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You know about yeah. the elevator. And the mm-hmm. other one is imagine you've got a marble at the entrance to the vagina and you're bringing it up as high mm-hmm. as you can and then let it go all the way back down again. So it could be the, the marble or the elevator. It's the same, it's the same thing. What, what's your views on, on those cues? I think they're both great. I think it depends on the person. I've also heard like, think like you're, mm. like you're drinking a milkshake. So it's not that like quick <laughs> sip, but it's that slow. It takes a little bit of resistance to get there. Um, I think those are all really good cues. I think it, again, is going to depend on the person, what they're kind of relating to. Um, But I think bringing a visualization into it uh, is always really helpful. Uh, Some cues that I don't really like are, you know, when we're more doing like the transversus and that pulling the belly button in or trying Mm -hmm. to contract the pelvic floor while you're pulling the belly button in, because that really kind of... um, 
it just puts the tension point at the wrong spot. And that can lead yeah. to a lot of bearing down as opposed to what we're like actually looking for. Um, so I like the cue also of like zipping up, like think that you're zipping up your pants. And so then you can go from like the pelvic floor all the way up through like the transversus, getting in the obliques, getting in the, um, you know, all the way up the core. Yeah. yeah. And there's also devices that people can use. What, what do you think are the devices for conditioning the um, pelvic floor muscles? Uh, again, I think it absolutely depends on the person. I think if somebody is really struggling and needs some pel- um, some visual feedback, I think devices can be great. So using a pelvic wand for feedback, so where you know you're inserting the pelvic wand uh, vaginally, uh, and then when you're contracting the pelvic floor, you should see it kind of come closer towards you. And then when you're relaxing the pelvic floor, it should drop away from you because you're getting the lengthening. Um, I think that can be really helpful for some people if they if there's someone who will really benefit from that visual feedback. Uh, and uh, you know, a lot of the pelvic wands can kind of double up as um, you know a tool that you can use for releasing some um, some trigger points and some pelvic floor tension as well. Mm. Yeah, interesting. So, so scars. So this is a really interesting one because you know I I work on scars. And you also mentioned desensitization, and I, I do that as well. Um, can you explain how you work on scars and what you do in terms of desensitization and why you do it? Amina was a 32-year-old personal trainer and mother of three when she came to see me. Amina, whilst training to run a marathon, experienced lower back pain and sciatica. Amina's back pain meant that she couldn't run without pain and had completed her last marathon in a disappointing time for her. Amina wanted to complete a half marathon in under one hour, 50 minutes, eliminate her back pain, and get back to running full distance marathons. I devised a corrective exercise program for Amina to realign her postural imbalances and help improve her stability, which she completed for 30 minutes a day, five days a week. After working with me for a few months, Amina completed a half marathon in one hour, 45 minutes, beating her target time by five minutes, and now she has no lower back pain or sciatica. Amina has since gone on to complete several full-distance marathons, finishing with good times. If you'd like to achieve similar results to Amina, you can contact me at www.bodycheck.co.uk to secure your consultation. Now, back to the podcast. Yeah. Um, So... So as the nerves, so when we make the incision, there are superficial nerves that kind of get cut. And so they're going to need to, to heal. And as nerves heal, they kind of can like misfire. It can feel, um, it can feel really uncomfortable as they're getting used to just normal sensation. Again, it can feel really intense. Um, so that's kind of the main purpose as to why we're doing desensitization techniques is just to kind of aid in the healing process of those, you know, more superficial nerves that were affected by the incision and by, you know, the scar tissue um, building up there and how I work with it. So if it's a, we'll talk C-section scar, um, I... I don't do any scar massage before the six weeks. You want to make sure that the incision is fully healed first and we're not, you know, putting anything over top of it. Um, But we can start the desensitization techniques really early and often. And I would say if somebody had more of a traumatic experience with their C-section or if they're a little bit more um, squeamish, they don't really like, you know, the sight of blood or the sight of um, an incision is really uncomfortable to them, I would try to start it earlier. And that can be, you know, hand above, hand below the incision area without looking at it to start if, again, it was someone who had more of a traumatic experience with the birth or is a little more um, squeamish and uncomfortable. And just breathing into that space, so directing your breath there, can allow for a little bit of stretching to the tissue really gently and just get that tissue used to moving again. Um, as well as, you know, the, the sensation of your hands again, above and below the incision, you don't want to give a couple, like an inch or two on either, either side of it. Um, and then from there, you know, working on, you know, looking at the incision and kind of getting more comfortable with it is going to be important also. Um, but for 
the sensitization or desensitization is really, again, above and below before that six weeks and before you get the clearance. And then once you're cleared and the incision is healed, you can do it directly over the incision. Is I like to start with a Q-tip and just kind of fray it out a little bit and just that really light sensation. And once that feels comfortable, kind of going to a different texture. So then maybe it's it's a bigger cotton ball. And then maybe we're doing um, a soft cotton t-shirt. Um, and then, you know, a, a clean toothbrush. So like just different textures, different sensations that you're getting your body used to. Um, and, you know, once you're, you're cleared, you know, at that six week mark, then I'll start doing some scar massage, but again, really above and below, um, the incision to start. And then it's not until closer to 10 to 12 weeks that I'll really do like a deeper scar massage just to la- allow all those layers to really be fully healed. Uh, and what um, when, when you're doing scar massage, what, what direction are you doing? Are you doing cross or, or longitudinal? All of it. Okay. So I'll, I'll, yeah, I'll start going with the direction of the incision first, just to really get, um, again, get that area used to the sensation and the touch that's usually, you know, the easiest direction. And then I'll go up and down um, because that's, you know, in the exact opposite direction. But what I like to do too is is circular motion. So counterclockwise and clockwise and then really lightly. And then whatever area I feel like the clock is kind of stopping. So wherever there's some restriction, uh, that's the direction that I'll go in and I'll kind of focus in that direction. So whether it's like two o'clock, or, you know, one or, or what have you, and kind of just focusing in that direction um, for a while first, and then doing the clock again, and then kind of moving um, segmentally along the scar in that direction. And you're going to notice, you know, depending on the length of the incision, um, you might be feeling uh, restriction in one direction um, on one end of the scar, and then on the opposite end of the scar, it might be in a completely different direction. Mm. And do you do any, any trigger point work on the scar? I don't typically do trigger point work on the scar itself. Um, well, I guess I guess a little bit in the fact that I'll like I'll hold some tension there until we feel mm. a little bit of release and then kind of go, but not not anything like deeper for me. Mm. Yeah, yeah. What what I've tended to do um, with postpartum clients, I screen the scar and I use mm-hmm. the, the the round end of a paperclip, and you just put a light pressure on. And you're just sensing to see where they feel the trigger points, and mm-hmm. then, with, and I always say, I always say to them, this is no extra cost, but you can have the paper clip, and mm-hmm. I and I teach them how to trigger point their own scar. So again, they can do that, you know, as regular as, as you know, as they, you know, possibly daily. The the other thing I was going to ask you about: Are you familiar with viscerosomatic reflex? Um, not not too much now. Okay, so. So the most commonly known example of a um, viscerosomatic reflex is when someone has a heart attack and they get pain down the left arm. Yeah. So that's okay, where, so like re- referral pain. Yeah, yeah right. referral from you know a viscera to like the musculoskeletal mm-hmm. system. Well, we we have the same thing with pain, right? It's what's called pain inhibition, but you also get it with scar tissue. So you know when you've got a a scar. I mean, normally it's a, f- a fresh scar or fresh-ish scar. But again, if you don't if you don't rehabilitate properly, that can just continue. So another trick that I use with um, postpartum clients, well, it, could, it could be any scar to be honest, but particularly C-section scars, is that before they do any um, attempts to activate the, the abdominal wall. So, for instance, if you're trying to you know do an isolation of the transverse abdominis exercise. You'd actually ice the scar, and what that does is it actually switches off the afferent nerve impulse coming from the scar into the nervous system. So it shuts off the pain inhibition, so you can actually access the transversus abdominis, and in particular, the the it's the slow twitch that tends to switch off first when there's mm-hmm. pain in a region. So I've just found that to be very useful, particularly in the very early stages of rehabilitation, particularly of the abdominal wall to get someone to actually ice the scar till it goes numb and then mm-hmm. and then you do your you know abdominal exercises nice yeah i, I mean that definitely makes sense i mm. 
I've done ice, you know, ice massage sometimes if mm. people are uncomfortable with it, but I like the idea of doing it beforehand if we're mm. having a hard time uh, finding that contraction. Yeah. Yeah. Again, from your experience, what type of chronic pain can develop further down the line from postpartum issues if they aren't addressed, you know, relatively soon after childbirth? Oh gosh, I feel like so many, pretty mm. much chronic pain anywhere yeah. possibly could stem back to it. And I think that's for, you know, a multitude of reasons. Um, but I'll, I'll go first with like the more obvious ones, um, is any type of back pain, whether it's, you know, upper back or low back pain, um, very much can stem from, um, a postpartum that wasn't fully recovered, uh, hip pain and pelvic pain, whether that's, uh, intravaginal pain, uh, you know, Unfortunately, so many women have pelvic pain or you know, pain with intercourse um, and they just normalize it. And again, it doesn't go away. And, and that's for many reasons. One, they're not addressing the, the cause of the pain. And then on top of that, they are now associating those activities with the pain. So again, it kind of feedback loops onto itself. Um, but yeah, so pelvic pain, hip pain, back pain, I think are all really common ones um, that can be chronic pain related from um, from a postpartum that's not recovered. Um, but I, you know, it really can be pain anywhere. It can be chronic headaches. It can be neck and jaw pain. Again, we talked a little bit about the mm. connection with the pelvic floor. Um, but even from a more, you know, just the, the trauma aspect of the birth experience, even if it's a good birth, it's still traumatic in the body and we can still hold a lot of tension because of that. And that can kind of feed into, you know, lots of chronic issues, whether it's chronic pain or other, you know, chronic diseases, um, just by our body holding onto that tension and not functioning properly. Yeah. So the answer is it can cause almost anything, but the main ones are kind of lower back, pelvic, hip uh, issues. But again, yeah. And I, I would really include kind of jaw and neck pain in with that as well, because just yeah. because of how closely related they are. Yeah. Yeah. It's interesting as well. Obviously, postpartum, there's a lot of lack of sleep as well. And obviously, you need sleep to recover properly as well. So, the other thing I was going to mention is, um, you know, we've, we've been using the analogy of running a marathon and training for a marathon, but when you think about it, most people's time that they're in labor is a lot longer than it would take them to run a marathon, right? Yeah. And it's probably a lot more intense giving birth than it is jogging, right? So, we, you know, we, def we definitely need to condition ourselves I, I always like an all, all all my clients regardless of what their goals are is i always say to them imagine you, you're going for a gold medal in the olympics how much dedication do you need to put into that and then think right you need to put that sort of level of dedication into whatever goal you're looking to achieve now yeah it's definitely and and with the um the marathon analogy average is around around it's like four and a half five hours for mm. the average um i know it's i know it's a little bit longer than the four hours because i come in around four four and a half and i remember that was like slightly above the average and i was so excited about that i was like yes all right um but the average birth especially first time birth is is a lot longer mm. i mean you can have average pushing hours of <laughs> marathon times yeah. that was that was the case with my son i pushed for three and a half hours with him Okay, so I've got one one more big question for you. Yeah. And, you know, for, for me, it's one of my favorite subjects and it's the subject of emotions, which is, which is why I became an emotion code practitioner. In your opinion, how important is it to address emotional healing postpartum with regards to physical pain? It's essential. I don't think that it's, you know, how important it is. I think it absolutely needs to be done. Um you know, there's, there's such a big connection between what we're emotionally feeling and what we're physically feeling. Um, you know, even where we're feeling certain things. Um, but especially, you know, we, we hold our emotions in our body and, you know, I, I feel like it's not even a matter of like, if you're believing that at this point in time, like it, it's, 
just, it's just what it is. Like we hold our emotions in our body, but if you still need convincing, like look at how you're postured, look at how you're standing and how you're feeling. And they often correlate. So if you're like feeling a bit down or if you're scared or anxious and you're kind of curled into that fetal position, tails tucked between the legs, things like that scared dog, all of that's still happening in your in your body like you, as you're feeling those things. And that creates then, you know, more tension. So as your tail's tucked and you're clenching your glutes and you're holding so much tension in your pelvic floor because you're feeling stressed, overwhelmed, anxious, um, what have you, any, any kind of negative, in quote, emotion uh, that you're likely feeling postpartum because it is a very challenging time. And as we... Mm stated before, we don't have a ton of support networks and support systems set up in our society as it is at the moment. Uh, So it just leaves you feeling like you have to do it alone. Um, We're not really told that we need to process our birth story, again, whether it was a good birth or if it was a more traumatic birth. You know, we have to sit with that. We have to experience it and process it and process it on your own, not in the way of like you're telling your birth story. And then all of a sudden you're having like five other people tell you there's like, oh, well, mine was this and mine was that. And it can feel kind of invalidating or like a Mm. one up type of situation. Um, But really kind of sitting with it, experiencing it. And, you know, I feel like birth is a very transformative time. The postpartum period of, of life is very transformative. It it literally rips you open. It cracks you open. Um, we're more emotional initially, you know, physically or cracked open. We have all of this, you know, physical work that we have to do all of which we kind of just talked about. Um, but it, it brings up a lot emotionally as well. Our brain changes, you know, we're more getting more attuned to our baby, but we're also, you know, kind of more, prone to be wired towards anxiety just because we're kind of picking up on all of the things that could go wrong to make sure that our baby is safe. Um, so I think we, we absolutely have to address them. And that's, you know, that's really a big reason of why I also started doing what I do is that I very much clearly believe in the physical recovery, that physical recovery is needed, but it has to go hand in hand with the emotional support, with getting a sense of where, Um, our moms are at emotionally and the healing needs to happen side by side, not kind of, you know, doing work with one and then maybe, you know, doing work with the other, or, you know, let's say you're experiencing more postpartum depression than what you're noticing physically. And so you're tracking that way, but then leaving the physical recovery out. Like we, we have to start doing both and we have Mm -hmm. to start doing both, um, together. I mean, there's, there are studies that show, you know, women who have pelvic floor dysfunction, pelvic floor issues after birth, they're more likely to experience things like postpartum depression. And, you know, it's, it's a correlation. So, it, you know, it's not to say like what comes first or, or why it's happening. But, you know, the fact that there is that strong correlation there is something that needs to be, you know, looked at more. Yeah. And do you, do you have any specific recommendations to work on the kind of emotional aspects? Yeah. So, so I do a lot of it through, through yoga. Um, I guess as I was kind of giving my spiel in the beginning, I, I didn't mention that I'm also a yoga teacher. I've been for about seven years now. Um, so I bring a lot of that into my practice, both with the mindset of really, you know, bringing in mindful practices. So, you know, whenever I'm doing a physical activity, there's also a really big mindfulness component to it of really just even just bringing the attention to the muscle, focusing solely on the exercise that you're doing in the moment can be really helpful. Um, And then through the practice of yoga and then really with the breath work, and I would say that's the easiest thing that we can probably start with. And it has such a benefit on our physical recovery of the pelvic floor uh, because of the connection with the diaphragm and the changes that our body made in pregnancy, uh, and that we have to kind of reestablish postpartum. Um, but just then with, you know, with the breath work, being able to bring you into the present moment and also allow you to kind of sit with the emotions that you're feeling, but in a more, you know, relaxed state. 
And that's that's really interesting. But you, you may not know, but a long time ago, I co-wrote a book called um, The Anatomy of Yoga. And it's actually the way that it's written. So it's not it's not a purist yoga book. And the person that mm-hmm. co-wrote it with me kind of looks back and wishes she hadn't written it now, I think, because she's, she's a real purist. So she studied in India for years. Um, but what it does, it teaches people yoga poses depending on what your posture is. Now, obviously, mm-hmm. women that are postpartum, I mean, I've, I've never seen a woman postpartum that doesn't have an upper cross syndrome and a lower cross syndrome. So there is a whole section in there for that posture. So there are specific yoga poses that people could do to help realign those specific uh, muscle imbalances. Yeah, no, I didn't realize that you were thought I'll have to take a look at it. Um, but yeah, I think, you know, and to me, for me personally, and again, what I bring into my practice um, as well is that really yoga is a really kind of that connection again, that, that yoking of the mind and the body. And mm. so I feel like it is so important in postpartum because again, as we're cracked open, we're also really disconnected. Um, so we're kind of in this phase where we're, we don't really recognize who we are anymore. We're in, we found a ladybug. Okay. We're in this transition <laughs> of, um, you know, becoming a mother and matron essence and that, you know, that whole transition of who you are and if your values are shifting and even you know, how you're identifying yourself tends to shift. Uh-huh. Um, but then also, you know, the physical transition and not recognizing your body anymore, feeling very uncomfortable in it because of the physical changes and the, just the discomfort from not allowing it to you heal or really knowing what to do to heal it and rehabilitate it through the postpartum period of time is that, you know, for me, we can do a lot of the the mental emotional support and a lot of the physical support. And then yoga is really that bridge that really helps bring it together and allow you to integrate it into your life in a, in a simpler way. You know, you can do a five minute yoga practice and kind of gain a lot of the benefits of what you were doing in your PT session. And then also, um, with your, your emotional recovery of just sitting with what you're feeling, processing it, identifying it, is, I think is a huge piece of it. Uh, so just to finish up, what would be perhaps your top three tips for women that they could be thinking about having children, they might be pregnant now, or they might be postpartum. What would, what would kind of be your top three tips for you know, being as healthy as possible and, and particularly trying to avoid pain because of the birth going forwards? Yeah. Um, I would say one, if you're, you know, if you're thinking about having kids or if you're pregnant, uh, is to not be fearful of the pain. You know, I think that's a, a big one early on is that we get so up in our heads because we don't really know what to expect. We don't really see a lot of, you know, what the birthing process looks like. Um, and so we create these stories in our head. So I would say, you know, it's nothing to be afraid of. And so working through that, I think can be really helpful because I find that the more we're anticipating pain, the more likely we are Mm. to experience it. So kind of working with yourself through that. And now I'm not saying that birth is not going to be uncomfortable. Mm. It is, it's uncomfortable. Um, but you can get through it. Um, and just, you know, taking the fear out of it, expecting that there's going to be discomfort, uh, and the like, different sensations that you're used to experiencing. Um, but what I would also say is that you need to plan for your postpartum like you are planning for your pregnancy or your baby shower in the nursery. I think there's so much planning that goes into having a baby, especially nowadays, and especially if um, you're on any type of infertility struggle. Like you're planning that pregnancy the whole time. You're, there's mm-hmm. a lot of attention on what you're doing in your day to day. And, um, you know, and I would say not that it's the most common way at this point, but it, it is far, it's far from uncommon. Yeah. Um, but we really do need to plan for a postpartum like we plan for any stage. And I would say, honestly, like more so, like it's more important in my opinion to plan for your postpartum recovery than it is to plan for what your birth is going to look like. Cause that's going to unfold how it unfolds. And you mm-hmm. can, you can be the most prepared as possible and things are still going to take their own twists and turns. Um, 
you know, with that being said, of course, you want to, you know, do what's in your control to make it a good experience. But, you know, really planning for a postpartum and what that looks like is it's, you know, getting your support systems in place, understanding what your boundaries might be and talking about them. So like, when are you going to want visitors? What is that going to look like? Uh, If you have a partner, making sure that they're on the same page as you with that and talking about that, you know, earlier rather than later is going to be helpful. Um, But also getting getting in place who you might need to call if you need um, emotional support. So having, you know, a few names of different therapists um, or counselors on hand that you can potentially use. So just being prepared in that way, planning with your physician that you're going to have more than a six week checkup Uh, in the U S it's, it's recommended that you have three follow-ups within your first 12 weeks. Almost no one gets them. In fact, um, I just saw today that 20% of new moms aren't even making it to their six-week appointment, which is like their first and only appointment. Um, so talk with your provider, whether it's your your OBG or your midwife, that you're going to have you know, a, a four-week, an eight-week, and a 12-week follow-up, that that's what you would like as long as things are going smoothly. And then you go from there and add on if and as needed. Um, writing down and making a list of who you're going to work with physically. So whether it's a post, you know, postnatal coach or a pelvic physical therapist or, you know, someone that has postpartum experience in physical therapy, uh, so that you have those resources in place, maybe even schedule your first appointment with them for a few weeks after your, your due date and you can adjust from there. Um, but I think, I think having that in place is, going to be hugely helpful because you're you're not going to be scrambling last minute when you're already tired, when you're already thinking, oh, well, do I really need to do this? No, you have it there. You have things scheduled. You're going to, you're going to be more yeah. likely to go. Yeah. That's some, some really good advice there. And what's, what's next for you, Ariel? Oh, what's next for me? <laughs> um, well, I'd say more more of the same at the moment. Um, you know, I am I'm taking on clients, like I said, north of Boston for in person work. I am really starting to shift more towards the virtual online space. So I'm working together towards um, getting an app uh, together to have programming in place to make it more accessible, a little bit easier for new moms. Um, it's you know. You're still going to have a lot of one-on-one interaction uh, with me, but a lot of the stuff that you can do on your own. And then, you know, if and as needed, if you need more physical one-on-one um, support, we can kind of go from there and finding resources for you. Yeah, that sounds great. Uh, and where can people find you online? So I'm at findyourwaymama.com. Uh, you can find all my information there. And on um, on the social media networks, I'm I'm mostly on Instagram at my name Ariel Martone. And I have some free resources that you can find either on my Instagram or on my website. Um, you know, I think if you're early on in the journey, um, the one that I would recommend is um, you know there there's a a reference for nine things that you can kind of work on in your first six weeks postpartum. So your pelvic floor recovery guide that I think every new mom should grab because it's just some basic information that unfortunately is not handed out so readily. It's not information that you're going to get at mm. your doctor's office. So Yeah. Awesome. Ariel, thank you so much. It's been some really fantastic information and, you know, information that I know is, you know, not that well known out there and it's not well shared. So yeah, I just want to thank you for your time and, and for sharing your knowledge with, with my audience. Yeah, thank you for having me. Thanks for listening to my kids in the background. (laughs) Being flexible with that, I appreciate it. No problem. So that's all from Ariel and me for this week. But don't forget to join me same time, same place next week on the Radical Health Rebel podcast. Thanks for tuning in. Remember to give the show a rating and a review, and I'll see you next time.